Hey everyone, I'm Nick from the Coffee Before Arch and welcome to another installment of the uh, Fundamentals of GPU Architecture series. So in this one, we're going to go over, uh, you know, our start of the actual microarchitecture of uh, the GPU, starting at the SMPTE core, right? So this will end up getting broken up into two main sections, one specifically relating to uh, the memory system, and then this first part relating to the SMPTE core itself. And itself, we'll split this into a couple different videos uh, just, to kind of, just to keep them as self-contained topics. So what are we actually going to discuss? So like I said, um, this is really broken up into two chapters. So one of them examining the SIMT cores. So just as a reminder, SIMT stands for single instruction, multiple thread, uh, and how they're implemented. So, you know, we've got this kind of parallel programming model. So how does that translate to the actual hardware? And then the second part of it is uh, the actual memory system, which will be the next chapter. So um, let's get started. So that's kind of a little bit of a background to the microarchitecture. So again, everything started back at graphics, and we have you know eventually you know initially we were just storing these you know detailed texture maps, and of course these things can often be really huge. So they don't they're not going to be fit or they're not going to fit into the uh, on chip caches. So how do how did we design GPUs? So in order to have high performance, uh, what we end up having to do is, you know, we just we wanted to make an architecture that can sustain, uh, sustain large off-chip bandwidth. So this is why we have, you know, uh, instead of, you know, just DDR, we have GDDR, right? So the, the graphics double data rate uh, memory, right? So you know, higher bandwidth memory. And even even now in some models, we don't even have DDR or GDR, DDR. We've got um, uh, HBM or high bandwidth memory. Uh, okay, so, you know, we have tens of thousands of threads concurrently, so this can be kind of tough with all the caches, right? If we have lots of things kind of doing loads or stores, then, uh, you know, it's hard to exploit locality there uh, just because, you know, we could be accessing tons of different data. So it'd be really difficult to build a cache that can really sustain that. But that's not to say that caches don't work at all, right? So caches can still be effective because, you know, a lot of times, you know, there still is fundamentally some kind of locality. So take, you know, graphics workloads. Oftentimes, if we're doing something, maybe we're blurring an image. Right, so maybe we're just going to average some pixel values, right? So we'll have one center pixel and four adjacent pixels. And then we'll just, you know, that center pixel, that center pixel value, we'll just take the average of, you know, uh, the surrounding four pixels. Or maybe the surrounding uh, three, six, the surrounding eight pixels, All right? Uh, so there can be some significant spatial locality because if we, if we move one pixel to the right, well, you know, we're going to be using a lot of the same values and same if we move one pixel up or to the left or down, right? So, you know, a lot of times these caches are useful. Um, also in terms of the fact that, uh, you know, they, they provide a pretty good filter uh, for traffic going down to the rest of the memory system. So we don't want to just constantly be pumping everything into the memory system or at the lower levels of the memory system. If we can filter some of it out and, you know, remove some congestion uh, further down, it's always a good thing. So what we're really going to talk about in this chapter is really understanding how a single SIMT core works uh, and how it's really divided into a SIMT front end, front end and a SIMD or single instruction multiple data back end. So what these typically uh, get broken down into as well is uh, three main scheduling loops, right? So one of these is an instruction fetch loop. So this is made up uh, of, uh, so we'll go into that in just a second. So we have an instruction uh, fetch loop, we have the actual instruction issue loop, and then the actual register access scheduling loop. So, you know, basically fetching instructions, itch issuing instructions, and then, you know, uh, scheduling how we access the register file. And so those are the main schedulers we have. So as part of the instruction fetch stage, you know, this typically involves uh, the iCache, the instruction cache, you know, the decode logic, and then uh, the instruction buffer. So then after we do um, fetch, uh, we're going to issue, right? So the issue loop consists of the I buffer. So where do we put the instructions that we fetched? Um, the scoreboard, and then uh, which is going to handle some of our dependencies and then also issue, right? So uh, now that we've got everything, uh, now that we're ready to, you know, 
start an instruction, right, and execute it, or we have to, you know, that's part of the issue stage, uh, and then also the SIMT stack. So, you know, at every single instruction, we need to see which threads are actually active, and that's what we'll really focus on in this video. So, uh, and then finally, we have the register access scheduling loop. So this, this contains the operand collector, ALU, and memory. And we'll go into the operand collector in greater detail later, but basically, you know, because we have so many threads and we have limited ports on things like a register file, you know, we could wind up with some port contention problems. So what the operand collector really helps us do is schedule reads to the register file in such a way to remove, um, remove conflicts. And then the rest of it is, you know, really just more part of execution, right? So we've got ALU for you know, ALU operations and memory for the memory system operations like loads and stores. Um, okay, so in this chapter, we're going to really dig into those blocks and really understand them, uh, leaving out the memory system for the next chapter. So, you know, we're going to start at kind of a 10,000 foot view. We're going to work our way down to, you know, uh, say a 5,000 foot view and then down to say an 1,000 foot view. And um, we're going to do that uh, with these increasingly accurate descriptions that we'll call approximations because it's not going to include every detail of GPU architecture because A, they're not all completely available and then B, often they're not, often, you know, some details will be very architecture specific, so to a specific implementation uh, and it's not really useful to get, you know, too, you know, too drawn into those details. We really want to think of it uh, a little more holistically uh, from a little bit of a higher level. Uh, to really understand the greater, uh, the higher order trends going on. Uh, so, you know, here's here's the uh, here's the basic, you know, overall you know organization. So we've got you know the split between the SIMT front end and the SIMD uh, data path, right? So the SIMD front end, like they said, we've got fetch, the iCache decode, instruction buffer, and scoreboard issue in the SIMT stack. And then the where we're actually you know getting to the data side of things and the actual execution, we've got you know the operand collector, which will schedule our register file reads, and then also also feed into the execution stage with the ALUs and the memory, right? For the load store units, etc. So, you know, in, in these uh, approximations that we're going to be doing. So we're, we'll start with a one loop approximation. So we'll just consider one scheduler, right? And then we'll gradually build on and add more schedulers until we have, you know, our, our three loop approximation. So let's start with a one loop approximation. So what is a single scheduler? Uh, and this is not unlike if you were to just read the CUDA programming manual. So a lot of times, you know, the low level details are going to be abstracted away from you, uh, you know, by the programming model, but you know, in this case, you know, being computer architects or GPU architects, uh, you know, we really care about these low-level details that are usually hidden from programmers. So, uh, okay, so let's go ahead and look at that. So, again, as kind of a reminder, you know, because we're talking about things that are SIMT or single instruction multiple thread, we're talking about things that are grouped as warps or wavefronts. So we have, you know, a group of, in this case, for warps. Uh, 32 threads, and in the case of wavefronts, it's going to be 64 threads that, you know, they'll have a single instruction that will get executed for multiple threads, so SIMT. So, um, you know, this is the unit of scheduling that we're going to look at. So when we're talking about this one loop, you know, the scheduling is going to be, you know, at the warp level. Uh, so in each cycle, what happens? So uh, first, the hardware selects a warp for scheduling. So which warp out of, you know, we have big thread block that's going to be made up of multiple warps. So which warp are we going to take instructions from? So uh, in the one loop approximation, uh, the warps program counter accesses the instruction memory, right? So we just use a PC value to figure out which instruction we want and what we're going to execute, right? So after fetching an instruction, we have to decode it, of course, figure out what it is, and then also figure out uh, you know, what it uses, so which registers. And then these are fetched from the register file, right? So uh, that goes to the operand collector, which we'll discuss later. Uh, so in parallel to this, of course, um, while we're fetching the source operands from the register file, uh, we have to determine the values for the SIMT execution mask. Uh, so we'll talk about this more in uh, more detail later, but we have to remember that, uh, you know, 
the programmer can see these things as scalar threads, right? So every thread could potentially go down a different control flow path. So that means that in every step in the program, not all threads should be doing the same instruction. Some should be going in the if statement, some should be going in the else, uh, the else statement, right? So this SIMT execution mask is really how we do this. So we can mask off certain threads and say, you know, threads zero through 15 um, are active right now. They're doing the if, the if path. And then uh, threads um, 16 through 31 will do the else path later, right? So you'll have, you know, half of, you know, 32 bits be zeros and half of it be ones, and then it'll reverse when they go down the other path. But like I said, we'll discuss that in a little bit. So after we figure out who's supposed to be active and we have the source registers uh, ready, so then we can of course go to execution and this occurs in a single instruction multiple data manner, right? So we have one instruction and add and we've read out you know, from this vector register file, you know, all the different values we need. They're working on all different data and we're just, you know, we're chugging along, right? So we're doing it adds, multiplies, maybe memory accesses. So, um, you know, you know, as far as this goes, you know, we'll have special functional units that may have very, uh, you know, commonly used, but less common than say adds and subtracts and multiplies. So maybe square root functions in there or sign functions. Uh, we'll also have, you know, load store units, floating point units, integer units. And then in Volta, we also have tensor cores, right? So this is more of a matrix multiplication um, and addition kind of operations. Uh, that, uh, that's really useful for things like machine learning, which is mainly uh, things like matrix multiplication. So uh, just as a brief aside, so when we're talking about these, so, uh, you know, these ALUs, they're also, you know, you can think of them as wide ALUs. So uh, these functional units will often contain as many lanes as there are threads within a warp. So it'll be a 32 wide special functional unit or a 32 wide integer functional unit, etc. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, it doesn't have to be the case. So you could, you know, make this a little bit more narrow. Maybe it's only 16 threads wide uh, and you could pipeline it. And then you could, uh, like I said, increase the clock speed. And then, you know, you can get higher performance per unit area at the expense of some increased energy consumption, right? And so you can pipeline the execution units uh, or in increase the pipeline depth, right? Okay. So let's let's talk about the more interesting part of this, right? So which is the SIMT execution masking, right? So that's that's the thing that we've kind of pushed off to the side up until this point, and now you know we can't avoid it any longer. So you know how do we determine which threads should be active, and how do we keep track of it? So um, from the standpoint of functionality, you know we have this abstraction of individual threads that can be completely independent. Uh, so this it can be done potentially via predication alone, but this isn't how it's implemented today. So, you know, there's, as always, there's a lot of different ways to implement something. And so, you know, by pure predication, that's not how this was implemented. Uh, so the way it works today is a combination of traditional predication. So you can think of predication as just kind of flagging something as, you know, you know, true or false, right? So whether a predicate is set or not. Um, and then along with a, a stack of predicate masks, right? So we call this, you know, traditionally the SIMT stack. So this, this helps us handle two key issues uh, when all threads can execute independently. So one of them is nested control flow. And then the second one is skipping computation entirely um, while all threads avoid, uh, while all threads in a warp avoid a control flow path, right? So, you know, we want to make sure a branch divergence that we're not wasting any time there. So those are the two things that we need to handle. Okay. So the SIMT stack can, of course, handle both, both of these. And then in descriptions of the uh, SIMT stack, and this is mainly found by looking at, you know, patents filed by places like NVIDIA, as well as inferring things from, you know, the instruction set manuals. So it's at least partly managed by special instructions. Um, but the, what we'll describe it as here is a slightly simplified version uh, that was part of an academic work. So what are we going to use to describe this? So we'll start with some CUDA code and also some uh, 
a PTX. So as a reminder from the previous videos, PTX is the virtual instruction set. So this is uh, this is not what actually gets executed on the hardware. This gets another assembler pass on it, an optimization pass before it gets turned into SAS, but it's a good proxy for you know what this will end up doing uh, in hardware. It just might be missing some of the hardware specific details. So, you know, so again, let's let's think about this in two cases. So let's first talk about it, you know, if this was a CPU executing this code. So this is basic C code. So what would it look like if we have a CPU that has a single thread? So if we have a single thread, what happens? So it's a do while loop, right? We know that from here and here. So what we're going to end up doing is, you know, we'll go in here, we'll set T1, T2, T3, T4 to some values right here. Uh, so this is this block A, right? So every, so you know the thread will go in and block A, and then what happens? It'll it'll evaluate an if statement. So if that if statement is true, what happens? You know we'll go in there. If it's not true, we'll go into that else statement down here, right? And then we have these sub blocks in here, right? So you know if we go in here, we go into this B sub block. Otherwise, we go into an F sub block. Now, if we're a single thread, we just make a decision, right? We go into one or the other. Um, so in this case, let's say we go into the if block, we have another, we, we do another lo uh, load into another variable T5. And then, you know, we decide whether we want to go here in this if or over here at is this else, right? So, you know, again, this is a single thread. Only one of these decisions will be made. So we'll either go in here or we'll go in here. And then eventually we'll, you know, either add something to X or add something to Y. And then after we get to this point, you know, this if block is done. So, you know, we'll go over to this I plus plus. Right? Otherwise, if we go, if, if this fails, you know, we'll just go directly into this if this or this else statement, do this Z plus equals three, and then we'll just go ahead and exit out here. Right? And then we have one final check, which is just the while loop, right? So what is, so, so that's, you know, that's basically how that looks as a CPU. So where do we run into trouble when this turns into a GPU? So in the example in this chapter, you know, we'll look at, you know, what happens if we have four threads? What is that going to look like? So, you know, everybody is still going to, you know, all be you know, going along together, executing the same instructions in a, single instruction multiple thread fashion starting here so everyone will load you know TID times in everyone will set T2 to this value uh, everyone will load from you know a different part in the array right because you know we are calculating things like a thread ID or things that might be hidden up above so we may be loading different data here but it's the same instruction it doesn't matter right there's a SIMD backend uh, so single instruction multiple data but it's the same instruction. Uh, then over here, you know, everyone will set T4 equal to zero. So where we run into trouble is right here, right? When we hit this if statement, what happens, you know, up until this point, all these threads, you know, at each instruction have been going along together in what we call lockstep fashion, right? But what happens if, you know, maybe only two threads or three threads go here. And this other thread doesn't, maybe this T3 not equal to T4, maybe that doesn't evaluate to true. So it actually doesn't want to execute, you know, this, you know, uh, evaluation that stores something into T5. You know, that's not its control flow path. And, you know, programmers see these again as scalar threads that can go anywhere. So how do we handle this, right? So we have to, so that goes back to this, you know, active mask, right? That says which threads are active. But this is really the motivating problem, right? If, you know, if we're doing this where, you know, multiple threads are kind of, you know, marching down together in lockstep, what happens, you know, if we get to this if statement, right? And then again, if we get another if statement, maybe, you know, only two threads go into that if block, right? And then how do we bring all the threads back together? How, how do we, how do we reconverge uh, all the threads again, right? Because by the time we get here to this I++, you know, we're out of this if statement, we're out of this else statement, you know, we've already passed this if else statement. So everyone should be together again at this point, right? So let's see how we kind of manage that. And then, you know, if we look at this in the actual um, P2 
PTX code, you know, it, it follows basically the same line of logic, right? So, you know, everybody does these same operations. The problem is, you know, this set P, set predicate, this P1 value that does uh, an equal to uh, comparison uh, based upon T3 and T4, so this is that if part, you know, this branch could either be executed, which would take you to uh, uh, F, let me scroll down a little bit, right? So you could either branch to F or you could not branch to F and go straight here into B. So again, the problem is some threads could branch to F while other threads will go straight down. So uh, we don't need to go much more into the this assembly. It's the same idea as that CUDA code. But again, you know, we'll use things like uh, predication. So like a set P where we do a logical comparison and then we'll branch based upon that predicate. All right, and the predicates are just predicate registers. Okay, so uh, let's kind of continue on and then let's look at an example, right? So we'll ignore this side of things. Uh, this is the actual stack itself. So this TOS stands for top of stack, um, not the original series if you're a Star Trek fan. Um, so let's start from a control flow graph point of view. So here we're at A. So this A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this corresponds to each of these blocks right here, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So what happens? So we all start out together. So this is our active mask. This is which threads are active at this point of the program. So let's say that as we move down, uh, this is going to be our if, and this is going to be our else block, right? That outer level if else block. And then over here, we have our inner if else block, right? So what happens here? So we start out, everyone is doing that T1, T2, T3, T4 is equal to something. And then we hit that evaluation. So some of the threads go here to the uh, block B, some of the threads go here to that else block, which is block F, right? So what do we do at this point? So only some threads should continue down each path. And we mark that you know, by the active mask. So one means the thread is active, it should execute the instruction that we're on. So then, you know, it, it can, you know, it's nested control flow, so it can split again, right? So maybe only one thread goes into the next if block, and then two threads go into the next else block. Uh, but the important point is, you know, we have reconvergence points. So uh, reconvergence points are where we get back to the same active mask after control flow splits. So let's clear this up a bit. So uh, in the case of, you know, from here, from starting at block A, we split into this B and F, but then you know we're both going to reconverge back at uh, back at G, right? Because we we get back to the same active mask, so that's that we call that our post dominator, our immediate post dominator. And so the same thing happens over here, right? So you know we're at block B, we split, and then we reconverge, right? Right, so this is going to be our reconvergence point uh, for block B in this case. Not for block A, of course, because you know it, we're not reconverged to the same point here, but this is a reconvergence point for uh, this block B here. Okay, so again, let's just kind of summarize this. So we start out with everyone active, People, uh, threads go different ways, not at the same time. This has to be serialized. And so we see that kind of here. So this is a little better visual description of what happens. So we start at A, right? So everyone's going together. And then our control flow splits, we get if else. So we'll pick one path to go down. Typically this is uh, the majority path. So where most of the threads go. So we, we start at B, you know, and then we follow down that control flow path. So if we go back up here, we get to B, and then we go to C and then our control flow splits again, right? So we get an if and else, right? So what we'll do is we'll serialize it again. So, you know, maybe first we'll do C, then we'll do D, you know, and then after that we reconverge and then both, you know, all three of these threads will all do E, right? Uh, now, you know, this is mainly for illustrative purposes where it shows 
Um, you know, we don't necessarily have to. There's nothing that dictates whether or not we should execute, you know, the majority path first. Or in this case, when we have, you know, split divergence again, they execute the minority path first. This is really just kind of an implementation de decision, and we'll see that, you know, they cite a paper that says, you know, typically majority path work uh, first, you know, limits the, the stack size, uh, the SIMT stack size. Uh, but again, this is over time, right? So the important thing to know is that, you know, this ends up being serialized. Uh, and, but we'll talk about some more modern things as well later. But basically what happens is when we're all together, you know, everyone's doing the same instruction. In order to do different instructions, we serialize it. So three threads will do instruction B, only one thread will do instruction C, two threads will do whatever's at D, or in block D, I should say. Uh, not necessarily a single instruction, but it could be multiple instructions within one block. They reconvene and start all executing down the same path at E, these three. Then we go down the other line. So one thread does F, and then everyone comes back together at G, right? So we have our active mask is, you know, all ones. And then, you know, we all do, again, if we scroll back up to the program, everyone does I++ and everyone evaluates while I is less than N, right? So they all do that together, right? So that's a reconvergence point. Okay. So uh, let's see. Let's see where are we, so let's start here, right? So let's talk a little bit about reconvergence points. So this is a location in the program where threads that diverge can be forced to continue executing in lockstep. And again, what we call this nearest reconvergence point, uh, that's, or so, well, the nearest reconvergence point is generally preferred, right? Because we wanna be doing the most amount of work as we can at one time. We don't wanna have only a couple threads active, right? We're not gonna be progressing very quickly if we do that. So uh, the earliest point that can be guaranteed at compile time uh, and execute in a lockstep manner is the immediate post dominator of the branch that caused branch divergence. Uh, but you know some other papers have looked at you know er, uh, early reconvergence. Now you know all this stuff about you know reconvergence and active masks. You know, a lot of this is centered around the very early days of GPU architecture. As you can see, this is 11 years old, eight years old. A lot of this is kind of, you know, solved now as far as, you know, we know how to implement this, but there still is some interesting things in terms of doing more complex control flow in GPUs. And so again here, the interesting question is, what order should we, um, should be used to add entries to the stack following a divergent branch? So, you know, from this uh, AMD citation here, you know, they say to reduce the maximum depth of reconvergence uh, to be a logarithmic in number of warps in a thread, it is best to put the entry with the most active threads on the stack first, and then the entry uh, with fewer active threads. So again, they just show both, you know, two ways of doing this. So let's actually look at the, the, the SMT stack itself. So this is uh, just kind of like a table version of the SMT stack. So here we have, you know, we start out, we start pushing things into the stack, right? So, you know, where we're going to eventually go is uh, G, but, you know, we have this divergence here, right? So we have two different paths. So what we'll end up putting on is uh, both the paths. So, you know, G is where, the, is where they will reconverge and then, uh, you know, it, the next, the PC will start at F for this thread that has an active mask of one. And then we'll push on the other one that has uh, the next PC of B that has an active mask of, uh, you know, these, these upper three bits set. But they both reconverge at G, right? And that's this point. And so what happens is during execution, you know, we'll look at the SMT stack and this, uh, PC right here will tell us where to begin execution and it's not until we hit you know G that we say okay we'll all pop this entry off the stack right and then when we pop that entry off the stack right so this will go away and then we'll have the other side of execution to go down right so we'll choose F to be our next PC after we execute whatever's in that else branch 
um, we'll get down to here again, right? And then, you know, we'll pop this off the stack. And then finally, we'll be back at G. So our next PC will just, you know, be from that block G, right? So let's, let's look at it later in the program. So let's look at it, you know, considering if we go down the first, uh, go down the if block first. So again, so here's our original three entries in the SIMT stack. And we're going to have to push two more entries on, right? So we'll have to push on uh, an entry for, you know, if we go down, you know, for block C and another if we go down for block D. And again, this is showing, you know, the two different ways. So in this case, uh, the one that ends up being on top of stack is the majority path. And then in this case here, they put the one with the minority path on. But this is just kind of a design decision. This isn't, you know, a requirement for correctness. Okay. And so again, so now we have, you know, another, you know, nested piece of control flow to, uh, to consider. So in this case, we'll start with uh, the next PC being here, C. And then we have a new reconvergence point, right? Because, you know, we have nested control flow. So if we branch and we could go put two possible directions, we have to reconverge from that branch before we reconverge from the outer if statement. So our reconvergence point is E, right? So this is kind of like a local reconvergence point. So again, we're at B, we split, and then we reconverge, right? And so, you know, both of these E's is for both of these arrows here from C and from D, both go to E. So again, just to kind of explain how this works, you know, during execution, we'll look at this empty stack, we'll get our next PC, which is going to be wherever this block C is, right? We'll start execution down that block. We'll eventually get to block E, right? And then when we get to block E, uh, we'll pop this guy off the stack. This, uh, this next entry will become the top of the stack. And then we'll just start executing, you know, whatever is at block D, right? And then we'll go down until eventually we get to the PC value of E, which will be our reconvergence point. So we'll pop this guy off the stack and then we can start, um, you know, going, we can, you know, if we're already at G after that, if we go down the next uh, instruction, then we can pop that guy off and again, go down here. And that's really how we achieve this serialized control flow, right? It's just a matter of, you know, pushing entries onto the SIMT stack. And then as we hit reconvergence point, we'll pop them off and we'll keep popping them off until we get to, you know, the next PC that's valid. All right. So um, that's, that's about it. So that's going to be the um, overall uh, operation of the SIMT stack. So that's how we handle the fact that, you know, programmers can view these things as uh, scalar threads. It can all go different ways. Uh, even though we have a SIMT or single instruction mul uh, multiple thread execution model. So what are we going to discuss next time? I figure we'll probably leave it here uh, because this is more of a topic in and of itself. So, you know, you may be wondering, well, you know, what happens if, you know, we get stuck someplace where, uh, you know, part of our threads are waiting in half of, uh, or half our threads are active, they're in an if block, and maybe there's a synchronization call, right? Well, if half of our threads are active, you know, how can we ever synchronize if the other half are never making forward progress? So we'll talk a little bit about uh, this thing called SIMT deadlock, and then also, you know, how we could have stackless SIMT architectures. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode. That's a brief introduction to the SIMT core using kind of a one loop approximation. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, the other schedulers and things like the operand collector later. As always, feel free to check me out on GitHub. I have all the code from all the other series I do posted there. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at uh, coffeebeforearch at gmail.com. Comment on a video. Uh, maybe if there's a specific topic that you like, you know, maybe I can do a video on that. I do take things like viewer suggestions. And then, you know, I've been thinking about doing other things like a, a video or uh, video series on cache coherence and memory consistency. So, but like I said, that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. Again, uh, my name's Nick from Kafka 4 Arch, and I hope you have a nice day.